Welcome back to Kung Fu Explained and the second episode in our Shaolin Legacy series, which focuses on the Shaolin Temple and its history. In the first episode, we covered the political environment and historical background at the time the temple was established, including the reality of the widespread practice of martial methods in the area among the people from all walks of life out of practical necessity, as well as the military background of some of the monks at the temple predating the arrival of Bodhidharma or Damo at Shaolin. We also covered the introduction and development of Buddhism into China and the subsequent formation of the Chan or Zen sect and its core foundational texts, as well as the role Bodhidharma played in this up until the time of his passing. Now we will continue to move forward in the Shaolin Temple's timeline from the end of the Northern Wei Dynasty into the short-lived Sui Dynasty and into the early Tang Dynasty. I will also cover the story portrayed in the Jet Li movie, The Shaolin Temple. The Northern and Western Wei dynasties were followed by the Northern Zhou dynasty in 557 AD, which too was established by the Toba clan of the Xianbei people. This constituted the last Northern dynasty in China. As was explained in the previous episode, at that time China was partitioned along the Yangtze or Changjiang River following the collapse of the Western Jin dynasty. During this period, Buddhism had an extremely rapid development, and Emperor Wu of the Northern Zhou had become concerned of the power and influence such institutions wielded. Temples had become extremely wealthy and powerful, and this was deemed to be a threat to the ruling dynasty. In the year 574 AD, Emperor Wu launched a campaign of persecution against both Buddhism and Taoism, even ordering monks and nuns to abandon their monastic ways and return to lay life. Many Buddhist and Taoist temples were ordered to shut down, and this included the Shaolin Temple. The campaign against these religions lasted for six years, and the ban was finally lifted in 580 AD by Emperor Jing. At this time, the Shaolin Temple was reopened with a new name, that of Zhihu Monastery. It is important to note here that already at this time, the role and fate of religious institutions was completely connected to and dependent on the rulers of China and their politics. We often overlook the tricky environment temples and religious institutions had to and still have to navigate in order to continue to exist. They are not separate issues, and this is true in history throughout the world. Once again, this is human nature and not necessarily the fault of any religious or religion or political system at a basic level per se. It is in fact due to the trauma endured by the temple through this persecution that would shape and affect its actions, both within and without the temple, including how it aligned itself with warlords and dynastic rulers throughout its future. This also includes the basis upon which the temple sought to become further militant as well. We have seen this was echoed across the sea in Japan, and for much the same reasons. Towards the end of the northern Zhou dynasty, a regent in its court named Yang Jian, who also happened to be an ethnic Han Chinese, usurped its throne and established the Sui dynasty. He eliminated the Zhou royal family by having 59 of its princes slaughtered. Yeah, and here I thought the Taiwanese parliament was brutal. Yang Jian went on to conquer the southern dynasties and once again unify China. And he established his capital in Daxing, which would later be known as Chang'an. He took the title of Emperor Wen of Sui. Emperor Wen had converted to Buddhism and he saw this as a way to unify his subjects, in essence presenting himself as a Chakravarti ruler, or an ideal universal ruler who defends the Buddhist faith. He utilized the shared Buddhist faith between his, the people in the north and the south as a means to further unify his empire. Emperor Wen's government funded the construction of many Buddhist monasteries, as well as the translation of sutras into the Chinese language. 
By the end of the Sui dynasty, there were approximately 4,000 Buddhist monasteries and temples, with a population of almost 240,000 monks and nuns. At the beginning of the Sui dynasty, the Shaolin Temple reclaimed its original name once again, and, of course, the temple was positively affected by Emperor Wen's actions, who praised it and recognized the Shaolin Temple's immense significance. Emperor Wen commended the temple for its role in creating peace at the onset of the Sui dynasty, and he awarded the temple with a large swath of land, known as the Baigu Zhuang, or Cypress Valley Estate, which was some 100 plus acres lying between the temple and the dynasty's eastern capital of Luoyang. This estate will play an important role later on in this episode. What we can see here is the contrast between a dynasty that embraces a faith and one that doesn't, and how this can affect the actual situation for an institution like the Shaolin Temple and others. Literally, the survival of the temple was at stake. Should a dynastic ruler be opposed to its faith or feel threatened by the influence a religion may have on his subjects? This clearly displays the value and benefit a temple will enjoy should the ruler of a dynasty support it. This further highlights how the Shaolin Temple and Buddhism needed the patronage of each subsequent dynasty as this would determine whether or not the temple and the faith flourished or perished, as we have already seen. Keep this in mind as we continue. In 604 AD, Emperor Wen passed away and was succeeded by his second son, Yang Guang. It was during this period that the Sui dynasty started to feel the negative effects of an unsuccessful military campaign it was waging against one of the ancient Korean kingdoms known as Goguryeo. Much like today, foreign military campaigns, especially unsuccessful ones, place a huge burden on the nation and its people. Resources are utilized on such an effort, which are taken away from the nation and its population, and this breeds resentment and anger amongst the people themselves. The Sui population started to rebel and riot, and many warlords took over differing areas. During this time, Taiyuan's governor, Li Yuan, who was known as the Duke of Tang, rose up in an attempt to establish his own empire. In the latter part of the year 617, he captured the Sui western capital of Daxing, or Chang'an. As riots, chaos, and banditry ensued everywhere, Emperor Yang of Sui was assassinated in a coup, and this ultimately led to the collapse of the Sui dynasty in 618. Immediately following this, Li Yuan, the Duke of Tang, declared himself the Emperor of Tang. Meanwhile, a Sui general, Wang Shichong, upon hearing of the death of Emperor Yang of Sui, declared his grandson, Yang Tong, the new Emperor of Sui. So, at this time, you had Li Yuan as the Emperor of Tang in Daxing, or Chang'an, and Yang Tong being pushed onto the throne of the now collapsed Sui in Luoyang. Wang Shichong would shortly thereafter usurp the throne from Yang Tong and declare himself the Emperor of the state he called Zheng. It was now Li Yuan's state of Tang against Wang Shichong's state of Zheng. This was the dawn of a new period of political chaos. As I have covered in part one of this series, it is in times of dynastic chaos that societal stability is totally compromised and everything is run amok. This is why the martial practices were so widespread in the north of China to begin with. They were literally a necessity and a means of survival for all the people. At the end of the Sui dynasty, the peasants revolted. Both peasants and bandits attacked and looted numerous temples. Many temples in Henan, Hebei, and Shandong were violently attacked by such bandits who would loot, pillage, and destroy these places. The Shaolin Temple was attacked by bandits who were hiding in the mountains. The monks resisted and kept the bandits at bay for some time, but eventually the monks were overrun and the bandits looted and destroyed the temple, setting it on fire. This incident is recorded in the steel at the Shaolin Temple, erected in 728 AD, which states, By the end of the Daye period, the Sui Empire had collapsed. Bandits arose and looted everywhere, 
regardless of whether they were clergy or laity. Shaolin Monastery was attacked by bandits. The monks tried to defend it, but the bandits set fire to the temples and pagodas, destroying all the buildings. Only the pagoda for Buddha Bhadra survived. It was protected by the dragon and the holy spirits of the mountain. A miracle like this had never occurred before. The inscription does highlight that the temple did have a security force, comprising of monks and others, who were versed in martial methods. We already mentioned this was in place from Buddha Bhadra or Bhattu's time when the temple was founded. It was during this period of chaos at the end of the Sui dynasty that another key event occurred at the Shaolin Temple. This is the incident that is portrayed in the Jet Li movie, The Shaolin Temple. Produced in 1982, the film's plot is centered around this chaotic period between the Sui and the Tang dynasties. In the movie, Jet Li's character seeks refuge at the Shaolin Temple after being injured in a fight with his father's killer. At the temple, he starts to learn martial arts, and during this period, Li Shimin, who is Emperor Li Yuan of the Tang Sun, is being pursued and kidnapped by the generals of Wang Shichong and the state of Zheng. The 13 monks save Li Shimin and defeat the rebels. This leads to the establishment of the Tang dynasty under Li, all of which would not have been possible had the monks not defeated the Zheng generals and saved Li Shimin. Hmm, that's a little hard to swallow. As much fun as the movie was, that tale is unfortunately an extremely creative twisting of what actually occurred. It is mostly inaccurate and overblown. However, many people and Shaolin Kung Fu schools actually believe this film to be portraying historical facts and often repeat this tale. For example, on the website traditionalshaolin.com, it states, Fighting continued for several days before Li Shimin was captured by the Sui and the Tang army was defeated. The Tang army quickly sent a message to the famous Henan Shaolin Temple, desperately asking them for help. The monks rescued Li Shimin and returned back home to Shaolin. Li Shimin rose to power and became the first Tang Dynasty Emperor. On the Trip Savvy website, it states, during turmoil in the early Tang dynasty, 13 warrior monks helped the Tang emperor rescue his son, Li Shimin, from an army aiming to overthrow the Tang. On the USA Shaolin Temple website, it states, Perhaps the most famous of them is the story of how 13 monks saved the life of Emperor Li Shimin, who in return offered many gifts and honors to the Shaolin Temple. Now let's cover the actual history of this incident. As mentioned earlier, Li Yuan of Tang had consolidated his forces and defeated many of the warlords in the area and now set his sights firmly on Wang Shichong of Zheng. To this end, he ordered his son, Li Shimin, to launch a campaign against Wang Shichong and his state of Zheng. Li Shimin laid siege against the city of Luoyang. He was on the verge of crushing Wang Shichong's forces, but he needed to capture a strategic point to the southeast of Luoyang in order to finish this. This strategic location happened to be none other than the Cypress Valley Estate, or Bai Gu Zhuang, which had been awarded to the Shaolin Temple previously by Emperor Wen of the Sui Dynasty. At this time, Wang Shichong's nephew, Wang Rinzi, had invaded and taken control of the Cypress Valley estate. As Li Shimin was planning his attack to capture the Cypress Valley estate, the Shaolin Temple identified an opportunity to not only secure the land which was stolen from them by Wang Shichong, but also an opportunity to align themselves with the Tang, who were clearly on the verge of winning the war and establishing their full dynasty and control of China. The Shaolin Temple formally sided with the Tang army, and on the 23rd of May, 621, they captured Wang Shichong's nephew, Wang Rinzi, who was stationed in the Cypress Valley estate. They then delivered Wang Rinzi to the Tang as a hostage. Incidentally, the villain in the Shaolin Temple movie was Wang Rinzi, who was played by the famous swordsman Yu Chenghui. 
Although the Tang would have inevitably defeated Wang Shichong, this action by the Shaolin Temple was a crucial feat during this conflict, and also showed clearly the Shaolin Temple's support of the Tang Emperor. The Tang Emperor was extremely pleased and rewarded the Shaolin Temple. He wrote a letter for the temple, which was then placed on a steel, which is still there today, and actually bears the signature of Shimin. This was erected by the temple as a means of displaying political protection. Here are some key extracts from the full text on the steel. The world is in chaos. People are waiting for the true leader. The world is falling apart. The country is like boiling soup in a pot and the devils are rising. The Tang has been blessed and rises to protect the Dharma, allowing Buddhist teachings to spread around the country and make the Buddha present. Wang Shichong stole and occupied Shaolin Temple's property. He dared to act against the will of heaven. The master and the monks of Shaolin realized the changes and comprehended karma and vipaka. They made good plans and received good vipaka. They captured the fierce rebel Wang Rinzi and returned peace to this holy land. I shall reward you for this great achievement and set it as an example for the people. Everyone should peacefully resume his previous vocation, forever enjoying heavenly blessings. While the letter seems to be praising the Shaolin Temple, the last line clarifies what the Tang want the temple and its monks to do. In a sense, this is a letter of warning as well to the Shaolin Temple, telling the monks and the temple to focus on their monastic and religious duties and avoid political actions. In spite of this action by the Shaolin Temple and the document recognizing this by Li Shimin, the temple was not guaranteed peace from the incoming dynasty. Wang Shichong surrendered to the Tang on the 4th of June in the year 621. In the following year, the Shaolin Temple was shut down and its properties were seized by the government. This was in the wake of the Tang forcibly closing many religious institutions in the area and expelling monks and nuns on a mass scale. They did this preemptively as they were weary of such places still being loyal to Wang Shichong and that they might rise up in a rebellion once again. One could say that the Shaolin Temple, in spite of acting in support of the Tang, actually displayed the threat that such institutions and its adherents pose should they wish to rise up and start a rebellion. On the one hand, the Shaolin Temple acted in order to secure its positive future and curry favor with the Tang, while on the other hand, this action in itself revealed the fact that they could indeed pose a threat to the stability in the area, even for the Tang. This was why actions such as these were taken against the temple in the following periods. The temple was only reopened in 624, and the Tang only returned the confiscated lands in the year 625 AD. Whether they liked it or not, the Shaolin Temple, like all religious institutions around the world, had to carefully navigate the political environment in which they existed. These environments in ancient China changed regularly and could threaten the very existence of these institutions and the religions themselves. The Shaolin Temple was not ignorant of this and most of its formal actions were a result of careful political calculation. This is something we today often fail to realize and think that religion and its institutions are completely immune to the political environments within which they exist. This is a naive and ignorant point of view. From this historical incident, the story of the 13 Shaolin monks with staffs rescuing the Tang Emperor came to be. But this is a myth. It's a story and not an actual historical account. Do not take this as being a historical fact. The Tang Emperor is not someone who could be rescued by a handful of monks with sticks, if that were the case. Li Shimin was skilled in martial methods and was a military commander from his late teens. He excelled at military affairs and was known as one of the great archers of his time. There are accounts of him engaging in combat and fighting until his sword was broken and his sleeves were filled with blood. He even claimed to have killed more than a thousand men over the course of his military career. Li Shimin had great generals in his service 
including one named Yu Chi Jingde, who would later become known as Yu Chi Gong. His surname actually alludes to him being of Xianbei descent. He was known for his mounted spear skills, which were unmatched. He participated directly in numerous battles, and it is said that he even saved Li Shimin from certain death with his spear in one such battle. Li Shimin and Yu Chi Gong would always lead the attack in battle themselves. Some of you might be aware of the paired figures that are featured on the doors and gates of Chinese homes and other auspicious places, which are known as Minshin or door gods. They are placed there to ward off evil spirits from entering. From the Tang Dynasty onwards, these two figures are in fact Yu Chi Gong and another prominent Tang general, Qin Shu Bao. From this, you can understand how revered this Tang general was for his martial skills. Li Shimin commanded a military force consisting of tens of thousands of soldiers. They were all armed with spears, swords, bows, and armor. There is no way that such a person would encounter a situation where he himself would be in danger and a few outsiders like 13 monks with sticks could save him. This is not a realistic situation that would occur to someone of his stature. So we need to be clear. The story of the Shaolin Temple movie is a tale. It's a fictitious story. It's not a factual historical account. However, the root of this story is based on the factual account of the Shaolin monks kidnapping Wang Shichong's nephew, Wang Renzi, and handing him over to the Tang Emperor. It is in fact the exact opposite to the plot portrayed in the movie. The temple and its monks didn't protect someone from the kidnappers, they were in fact the kidnappers themselves. As martial artists, we can learn much from the actual history of this incident. First, we should realize the reality of military skills and methods at that time. We need to forget the myths of magical invincible monks with superhuman skills that can defeat professional soldiers who were well equipped. The actual skill the Shaolin Temple employed then was not martial skill, but rather political cunning and wit. They had the intelligence and foresight to be able to rationally evaluate the situation and act correctly in order to ensure their survival and that of the faith they were spreading. The lesson martial artists today can take away from this is rationality and down-to-earth logic in order to have our practices survive and flourish into the future. We need to learn how to persevere and adapt to any situation that may arise. This is true power. That concludes this episode of Kung Fu Explained and the second episode of the Shaolin Legacy series. In the next episode, we will continue through the Tang Dynasty and further. If you enjoyed this video, as well as my other endeavors, please do click like and subscribe. If you are able, please support Mushin Martial Culture on Patreon. Patreon supporters have the ability to submit suggestions for upcoming episodes of Kung Fu Explained that may be covered. Until next time, everybody, keep training.